Oh, thank you, Chairman. Well, General Engel, let's talk about C-130s just a little bit more. Totally parochial, uh, as all those discussions usually are. This is Rosecrans. Uh, before I, I ask my question, let me, let me say that actually on, on this topic generally, on the airlift uh, training, the weapons training, uh, that used to be much more year to year and much less specific in funding than it is now. I think both the Air Force uh, and the Guard have really worked hard with the committee and, and to try to get that to where it's m more, more understood. Um, at the 139th at Rosecrans, they do training in both of those areas for people from sometimes up to 20 countries in a year uh, uh, that we are, we are friends with to, talk, to, to train on airlift and weapons. Uh, we, we lost an aircraft last year, I think on the topic of um, just being sure that uh, our equipment is everything it ought to be. Obviously, that and readiness are appropriate. I think you knew I was going to ask this. When do you think we'll see a return of that eighth uh, aircraft to that training base? Sir, I think that, uh, you know, I think uh, over the Air Force program, everybody, every C-130 unit lost a, uh, a funded primary aircraft uh, in those units. Uh, it was how the Air Force spent its money around. And the Air Force is going to relook at that uh, towards the end of the FIDEP. And I'll give you a question for, uh, for the record. I'll come back to you and make sure I, I know when that's going to be right. All right, I'll, I'll let you follow up. On, with the Air Force on that for me, and I'll expect that for the record. On a question that I'd like all of you to think about and respond if you have a response, uh, obviously in the cyber space, I'm also on the Intel Committee, the cyber warrior space, the cyber space, a real challenge for us. I've always thought there was a unique opportunity for the Guard and the Reserve uh, to have that cyber warrior who's out there every day uh, in another capacity, seeing what's happening. And I, I just wonder what kind of programs, uh, General Lucky, starting with you, that you're looking at, and if we're able to take advantage of that capacity of someone who is uh, in a different situation most of the time, who actually, because of that, is probably better prepared for the daily challenges of cyber than others might be. So, Senator, first of all, thank you for the question. I, I, I would acknowledge and agree with your implicit assumption, which is sort of what you stated at the end, which is in many cases we have a lot of soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines out there working in the private sector, developing and sustaining incredible skills. Um, and we want to obviously bring them into or retain them in, in, in the U.S. military. As, as for the Army Reserve, as I said in my opening statement, Senator, uh, we have, uh, about two years ago we retasked the uh, two-star command in, in Houston, Texas, the 75th Training Command, to become the 75th Innovation Command. Um, it, it, it is now in the posture to both operationalize some of the challenges you're talking about and candidly take it beyond cyber to artificial intelligence, to take it to quantum computing and other places. I call it digital key terrain, as I said in my opening statement. We can go out there and essentially move structure to capture that talent and retain it for America and for the U.S. Army. So I'll tell you, we're, we're very aggressively pursuing that strategy. Um, it's, it's already paying dividends, and we are in direct support of Army Futures Command, which, as you know, is located in Austin. So we'll continue to press this. This is a journey of discovery, but I, I, to I totally agree with, with your, uh, your implicit assumption on this, and we will continue to operationalize. Yeah, I just think this is an area where people who aren't, who aren't in the full-time service bring a different set of facts and understandings to their effort to be a cyber warrior. Uh, General Scobie? Uh, Senator Blunt, uh, you are exactly correct. I'll put a fine point on this. I'll tell you what, what we've really seen and is in the Air Force Reserve Command. This year we stood up our first cyber wing. It's in San Antonio. And what we see there is recruiting and retention is very high in that wing because what we give our airmen the ability to do is our part-time airmen that work in this industry uh, across uh, America, they will fly out and uh, work the cyber mission that is there in San Antonio. We actually have them spread all over the country too in, uh, in squadrons. And they are um, directly responsible and move into active component uh, organizations as well. So there's these, um, these, these components that we have working hand in hand with the active duty and the reserve command. And they work very well. What we're able to do is we gain significant talent from 
industry uh, where they have great expertise, all the tech industry that you can imagine, and then we bring that uh, to bear. One of the things that's very interesting is um, the things that you can do in the military are much different than they are than you might be able to do in, the, in, in civil society. So it's, uh, it's interesting to them, which really helps with our retention, as you know from your other committees you sit on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, we have 59 cyber units in the, in the Army and Air National Guard. Uh, we have three uh, cyber protection teams that are mobilized to, today um, for all the reasons my colleagues mentioned about location of commercial and, and, and the nexus between the civil sector and the, and the military sector. The ability to train a cyber warrior and then retain him uh, as, a, as a potential warfighter is something that the reserve component does uh, extremely well. Um, we have started a unique program this year called Cyber Mission Assurance Teams. Uh, it's a program that looks specifically inside states, federal facilities, and makes sure that those facilities that are tied to uh, utilities and, and sectors that are not necessarily military in nature, that we can assure that power and, and, and support goes to the federal installations, and we're continuing that. Right. General James and then Admiral. Senator, uh, spot on with the question. So we are taking advantage of the civilian uh, skill sets we have out there. We do have talent within Marine Forces Reserve. Our, our largest IMA is uh, in the Marine Corps is currently at Marine Forces Cyber. We're currently standing up two uh, defensive cyber companies, one on the East Coast and one on the uh, West Coast. Realigning structure, no additional structure has been add, thrown to this yet. Uh, Senator equally said, you know, specialty codes is how we identify sailors and their skill set, and a cyber specialty code is identified as critical. When it's critical, it allows us to pull levers, which maybe restrict us otherwise. So things like recruiting quotas, mm -hmm. uh, we can uh, go beyond those quotas if we see a skill set. Uh, training recruiters what to look for. Joining partnerships, which we have done with uh, academic institution and industry, where those skill sets for cyber have evolved faster than the Navy's capacity to train to in some instances. In that regard, the ability to bring in, uh, give constructed service credit uh, for uh, a validated uh, industry skill that we can bring in sometimes and lateral into the Navy. So we are laser focused on this. Excellent. Oh, thank you all. Thank you, Chairman.